guys all get signed in and logged in and all the fun things so we can start our seminar here on equine herpes virus. Hot topic um, of recent. So uh, I'd like to give you guys just a few minutes and we'll get you started. I'm Dr. Abbott. Um, I'll kind of be part of the presentation a little bit later. We're gonna start you off with Dr. York and then Dr. Latcher is gonna kind of give you guys the local news update and what's going on in our area. Um, so give you guys just a few more minutes. We'll let Dr. York get up in here and we'll get started. All right, well, thank you for joining us for the seminar this evening. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of equine herpes virus in the news recently. It's been a hot topic, uh, both locally around here and also uh, throughout the horse show world. Uh, so we wanted to give you some basic information about the virus and things you need to know for how to uh, protect yourself and your horse. Uh, so to start with, we're just going to talk about what the virus is. Uh, so equine herpes virus is a very common virus in horse populations worldwide. We generally hear about it mostly when there's uh, some sort of uh, unfortunate outbreak going on, but it is actually much more prevalent than you might realize. Uh, the most common types uh, that we talk about in vet med are EHV1 and EHV4, but there are actually several different types, one, two, three, four, five, uh, that exist. These two are the most common ones we're going to discuss. Uh, most of what we're going to talk about today is EHV1 because that's the current outbreak. Uh, so EHV1 uh, can have several different forms, ranging from respiratory disease, abortion, a neonatal death, and neurologic disease. And the neuro disease is the current issue and the, the most uh, worrisome issue when we have outbreaks. Uh, HV4 is usually only respiratory disease. Uh, you can occasionally see abortion, uh, rarely also neurologic disease with that form. So almost all horses have actually been infected by the, one of the, or more of these equine herpes viruses by the time they're uh, two years old. So 80 to 90 percent of them will actually already have had it. Uh, but rarely do we actually see serious disease starting, um, even though these horses uh, commonly encounter the virus. Horses infected with EHV1 can also develop an issue known as equis, equine herpes virus um, myelonecephalopathy, and we're gonna call that EHM. That is the big deal, that's the neuro form that we're gonna discuss. So when I say EHM, it's just the neuro form of EHV1. Uh, that's gonna be an attack on the brain, the spinal cord, and can be very serious disease, uh, even fatal. Now, we don't know why some horses develop the neuro form, and some horses have just respiratory form, some horses have no signs at all. Uh, there's a lot uh, that may come into that in terms of the, the stress level, the age, the uh, uh, strain that the horses experience, but really what it boils down to is we don't know why the neuroform pops up sometimes. So the signs of EHV after infection can appear between 24 hours and up to several weeks after infection. Usually you're gonna see something pop up within four to six days if it's going to. Usually there's going to be a fever in two phases, meaning there's a fever initially on uh, day one or day two, and then the temperature goes down and then pops back up on day six or day seven. If there is a respiratory infection that you see, it can be clear or mucousy nasal discharge, uh, coughing sometimes, and swollen lymph nodes. So for the neuro form of EHV, fever is usually the big warning sign. A lot of these horses don't even have respiratory signs. Uh, so fever is what we're gonna look for to determine whether these horses are becoming affected. The neurological tissue is damaged by inflammation and blood clots of the uh, blood vessels surrounding the neurotissue, so surrounding the blood-brain barrier. Um, and then the signs that can occur if your horse develops the neuroform uh, range from incoordination, we call it ataxia, uh, hind limb weakness, like that horse you might uh, see in the image there, uh, loss of the tone of the tail, lethargy, dribbling urine, uh, a head being tilted to the side abnormally, and uh, leaning against a fence or a wall to support themselves, or sometimes the horse becomes recumbent and can't get up. All right, so here's a couple images of what this might look uh, like in a, in a really negative situation. So the horse on the left there you can see is supported in a sling. That's probably uh, taking place at a vet school. That horse is hospitalized and they're trying to maintain it uh, while it recovers, hopefully, uh, from this illness. Uh, the horse on the, uh, the right of the screen is in a posture we call dog sitting. So he's unable to rise with the hind end specifically. Um, and about, you know, the, the disease is very serious, about 50% may recover, uh, it can be very, very costly and very difficult to treat them. 
So most mature horses have developed some immunity through repeated natural infection when they were young, uh, so they don't develop very serious respiratory signs. The respiratory disease, if they get it, is not very serious. However, uh, due to the differences in immunity and the, um, the type of, of virus and the way the body reacts to it, um, the horses are really not that protected against the abortogenic or the neurologic forms of the disease, unlike the way they would be with a, neuro, uh, with a respiratory form. So there are vaccines against equine herpes virus type 1 and type 4 uh, for the respiratory disease and uh, abortion. However, none of those are guaranteed to be uh, protective against the neurologic disease. We do use uh, vaccines to try to decrease the severity and the, uh, limit the outbreak of uh, the neuroform, but understand that the neuroform is not something you can directly vaccinate against. So some of the vaccines we have will reduce the amount of shedding, that is the production of the virus uh, in the nasal discharge from the horses, and also reduce the amount of circulating virus in the horse itself. So it can help in an outbreak, but it's not something where you're gonna guarantee your horse is not gonna get EHV uh, just because he's been vaccinated. So typically, um, we recommend this vaccine for horses every six months. Um, and the type of horses we recommend vaccinating are those less than five years old, horses on a breeding farm or that would, be, uh, would have exposure to pregnant mares, uh, horses at facilities where there are a lot of other horses traveling in and out. So even if your horse isn't going to horse shows, if the other horses at your boarding farm are, um, they're going to trail rides, they're going to horse shows, um, you may want to consider vaccinating your horse. And also uh, performance horses, race horses that go to shows and go to uh, things like racetracks themselves. So the question comes up, if there's an outbreak going on, uh, do I vaccinate? Um, and that will depend on the, the status of your horse, how closely he's been uh, exposed already. Uh, typically, we are recommending vaccinating uh, in the face of an outbreak, but not if your horse has any symptoms and not if he has a fever already. Uh, so when we do that, we try to mitigate the severity of, of the uh, uh, potential uh, disease on your horse, but we're not going to be able to guarantee that he's not going to get that if he's already been exposed. The vaccines that have been shown to be most effective uh, against potentially decreasing the neuro strain are the ones um, that are labeled for a control of abortion and also the modified live uh, type of virus vaccine. All right, and Dr. Abbott's going to come up and uh, give us a little bit of information about where the virus uh, comes from when it pops up. Oh, that's really small. Hopefully you guys can all see that and read it. It's a little bit small, sorry about that. Um, but basically we're gonna talk about, go a little bit more, uh-oh, I'm gonna cause trouble. That's what I do. Um, sorry guys. Um, but we talk a little bit more about what Dr. York was talking about when she started the conversation um, and where does, where does this virus come from? And basically it is literally everywhere, right? Every, almost every horse on the planet has been exposed to this virus and has this virus. Um, like Dr. York said, 80 to 90% of horses are already infected. Just because they're infected doesn't mean that they're showing signs, doesn't mean that they're spreading the virus. What actually is going on is they have what's called a latent infection. So it's kind of just sitting in there doing its thing, hanging out in the body, not really causing any trouble until there's a reason for it to pop back up. Um, and this is what we call reactivation. So when we reactivate things, the virus, this is when we start to see the clinical signs, whether it's the respiratory signs, um, a little bit of a cold, if it's the really bad neurologic signs or even abortion. But the virus has to go through reactivation within the horse's body before um, we see those signs. So it can hang out in there. You know, your horse in your backyard probably has herpes virus hanging out. It's just there, but it's not doing anything. So yay, that's great, right? But doesn't mean that it couldn't reactivate if something happens. Um, the virus has to be activated in order for the virus to spread. So reactivation has to occur, clinical signs will then occur, and they, at that point, may start spreading the virus. Um, so how is it transmitted? This is the fun part, right? It's transmitted basically via the respiratory tract, so nose-to-nose -nose contact, contaminated people and equipment, um, and those community water troughs. Just, just don't, okay? Um, don't let your horses drink out of those. That breeds all the nastiness. You can get not just herpes virus spread, but strangle spread, 
flu, all the things. So bring your own water buckets. You can use the water at the show or trail ride or wherever you are, but bring your own water bucket. Don't share. It's gross. It's cooties. Gross. It can also be a little bit airborne. Um, the good news about the virus is it does not last long. So that's, that's really, really good. It doesn't last long in the air. So if a horse sneezes over here and you walk through that area, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes later, you're probably safe, but just avoid, you know, sharing of equipment and that kind of stuff because we don't want to pass cooties around. So why do some get it and why do some not get it? The real answer, we don't really know. Um, we think that a lot of it comes from different exposures to different stresses. So for example, you're going to um, a horse show and that's stressful on your horse. Their immune system gets a little bit weaker. So they're a little bit more prone to potentially shedding the virus or reactivating the virus that they already have and then shedding and getting sick. Um, Things such as illnesses, you know, if your horse has been through a really, really bad colic or something like that, that can cause them to pop the virus as well. If they've moved to a new farm, that can cause it. it horses are, you know, silly animals. They do what they do. Um, but anything that can cause them to get a little bit stressed out could cause the latent virus to reactivate and then clinical signs to appear. The other fun thing is, is the virus can be reactivated in the body and you might not see clinical signs. So the horse could be shedding or spreading the virus and your horse might not be showing any signs, but another horse on the farm whose maybe immune system is a little bit lower or maybe a little bit older, that horse might get show the, start showing the clinical signs and might actually be sick. Um, the fun part is there's just one tiny little bitty genetic code that there's a change in from the respiratory virus to the really, really bad neurologic virus. And so there's still a lot of research going on with this. Like I said, we don't really know a lot about it, um, but there is a lot of research going on and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot, a lot more continue to go on and a lot more information come out in the near future. So biosecurity. So I, I know you guys have seen these first three, right? You've seen them. You're gonna be quarantined. You're gonna wear, you're gonna be six feet apart and you're gonna wear a mask. I'm actually kind of joking about that. You're still gonna be six feet apart. You're still gonna wear a mask, but that's for Corona, not for herpes virus. That's, that's different. You don't really have to be six feet apart, but you do wanna keep your horses kind of separate from healthy horses. So if you have a horse that has the clinical signs, has been diagnosed with herpes, they're gonna be somewhere else. Um, you don't wanna share any of their equipment. You don't wanna share any of their uh, pitchforks, wheelbarrows, water buckets, anything like that. You wanna keep all of that stuff separate so kind of a little bit six feet apart, apart. Your horse doesn't have to wear a mask though, I promise it'll be okay. Um, the other thing you wanna do is you wanna take care of your healthy horses first, right? You wanna come in, you wanna feed your healthy, healthy horses, clean the stalls, do their waters, do all the things that you would normally do with your healthy horses before you go and take care of the sick horses. The pro Ideally, you have one set of people uh, kind of for your healthy horses and doing all the things with them and then one set of people doing things with the sick horses. I, I know that's not always feasible. The best thing to do is take care of the healthy ones, then go to the sick ones, disinfect everything that, you, that touches a sick horse, disinfect yourself, wash your hands, put foot, foot baths out um, so that you're keeping your feet clean, keeping your shoes clean, you're not tracking the virus or anything like that. Um, that's really the biggest thing with it is just kind of keeping all of the, everything separate between sick horses and healthy horses. Um, yeah, that's kind of, do you have a question? Yes. Okay. If a move happens, how long does it take to know if it is present or active? There's a quarantine protocol in place, but with the spread right now, is 14 days enough to know? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Say that again for me. If a move happens, how long does it take to know if it is active or present? There's a quarantine protocol in place, mm -hmm. but with the spread right now, is 14 days enough to know? Gotcha. So the question is, if you move a horse, how long before you would know if there is an active infection going on? There's quarantine in place, but is 14 days kind of enough to know that that's a safe time to actually move? Ideally, yes, 14 days is going to be plenty of time. Um, it takes that long for the virus to reactivate and to, for you to know um, if clinical signs are going to be Seen. However, that does not mean that we're going to see clinical signs. Remember I said that they, the virus can reactivate in the horse 
And unfortunately, the horse may or may not show signs. So they could be spreading the virus without us knowing. Um, so there's really no perfect um, formula as far as when you can um, move your horse. But 14 days usually is appropriate. If you want to be careful, three weeks should be good. Can you hear me now? All right. So the moral of this story is everywhere you see a red star slash dot, those are the outbreaks that we currently know are going on. So while we're located just above this star, <laughs> we're not that special. There's a whole lot of them going on. This is the European outbreak that's going on right now. And this one has done some pretty significant damage to horse shows. So as you can see, this is something that as a horse show population, we just have to live with and come up with the best right answer for the horses, for the people involved and the horse show environment. So we're gonna go through a little bit real quick about what is going on in Ocala and where the status of that is right now. Um, and we're gonna talk about a little bit more about what went on there and, and then we'll go into um, the FEI stuff going on in Europe right now, unless there's a question that I need to answer. Uh, we can hold this one. Okay, we're gonna answer that question at the end. So, oh yeah, you can skip the slide, I already said that. Okay, so at WEC in Ocala, which by the way is amazing, um, and they didn't pay me to say that, I have paid them a lot of money to, to get to say that. Um, <laughs> so I've been showing there a bunch this year. And one of the things that I've been really impressed with is that the barns from a biosecurity standpoint are set up really, really, really well. So all the things that Dr. Abbott talked about, yeah, there's, you know, there's not routinely foot baths going in, but you have separate doorways for an aisle way to come in. So the aisleways are also relatively short. So you can generally get a trainer in an aisle way. So you don't have kind of one trainer here and one trainer there. So you don't have barns really close to each other that aren't normally in contact. Um, the other thing is that the stall walls are solid all the way up on three sides. So you don't have horses touching that don't know each other. Um, from the front, the aisleway is about 14 feet across, which can I just say is amazing when you have two tack trunks and two horses walking through an aisleway and you can get that done. But anyways, I digress. Um, but what that means is that when the horse in the stall on this side of the aisle sneezes, it's not going directly into the neighbor's stall because the aisleway is only three feet across. So those are some of the things that WEC has done from a design standpoint that for a horse show really reduce the risk for the horses there. Oh, I forgot the most important one. There are water spigots everywhere. There are four water spigots per eight stall section. And again, what that means is nobody's sharing hoses. And one of the big things that I see at horse shows that drives me insane is people go down the aisleway watering horses and the tip of the hose goes from this bucket to this bucket to this bucket to this bucket. And that is a fantastic way to spread all kinds of diseases, strangles being the number one one. That's, that's a great way to spread. So with the way that they've designed it, you don't have to share hoses with anyone, no one. And even on the wash racks, there's big walls between you. So horse noses that don't know each other never have to touch, which is amazing. So that's the first way that WEC did things right. And that was years and years ago in the design phase. So thank you WEC for that. Um, the next thing that they did right was they found out late Tuesday, they did an announcement on Wednesday morning. So from that standpoint, we knew very quickly what was going on. We were told the horse that was affected you know, there were things put in place very quickly. They kept everyone informed as they knew about changes. The moment they knew that there was a second horse with a fever, people on the showgrounds were notified. Um, my trainer knew very, very, very quickly. 
Um, they did quarantine the affected barn, which was barn D. And I can tell you from my own witnessing of the event that there were 50 people in that barn scrubbing it from top to bottom with disinfectants. I actually was trying to figure out if I could borrow a few of them to take home to scrub my barn just for funsies. But so those are the things that I think WEC really, really, really did a good job on. What did they not do great on? Because there's always things we can improve, right? This is constructive feedback. But I have to say that I've experienced this at all shows. I think one of the really hard things to do with any event, right, is that you have a horse that was affected. You need to figure out what the minimum number of exposed horses was. So in this particular situation, that would honestly be all the horses in barn D. And so the best thing you can do in that situation is immediately quarantine all of that barn. But it's the same if we go to a trail ride, let's say, and we find out that a horse at a trail ride has been affected. Now you need to tell every horse that was at that organized trail ride that they were potentially exposed and those horses need to be quarantined. It's a gigantic task. It's extremely difficult. And as we all know from COVID, some of these things are met with extreme resistance. <laughs> so these are, this, this can be a little bit difficult. The other thing that's difficult about a horse show scenario like we have in Florida right now, which is somewhat similar to what's going on in Europe, is that it can be difficult to notify everyone who is exposed. You have horses who came in from other horse shows, may have stayed in that barn and then left. So those people may not have been notified as well as they should have if they weren't actually at the horse show that they were in the area near the horses that were affected. So I think this is something that all horse shows really struggle with. And then if you go to things that are a little bit less sort of concrete than horse shows, like trail riding events, um, you know, endurance, endurance races, those sorts of things, it can be difficult to know, you know, who was where with horse trailers, um, you know, who was camping where with what horses. And so that can make it really difficult um, to, to enact that. But I think doing the best you can to notify everyone who was potentially exposed so that they can be aware of it. So for me, what that means is, okay, I was in a different barn. So how did I handle that? So I was at WEC showing for both of one of the weeks that the horse that was there, that was initially affected. I was there showing for one of the weeks that horse was there, but I was two barns away. And I felt like it was a tolerable risk for me to take my horse to the horse show still. I wasn't in that barn. Now, if I had been in the same barn, if I had been in barn D, my horse was already at my house, I probably would have just kept it there, locked everything down at my house, and those horses wouldn't have left. Now, the way I handle that as far as being a veterinarian is that I take care of my horses in the morning, then I shower and change clothes, and then come to work. So that's how you... You kind of separate those two things. Um, it involves a lot of showers and a lot of laundry, trust me. Um, but what I did not do was take my horse to a different horse show, right? So I'm still with that same population of horses that was there when we found out we were affected. And I'm always sort of germaphobic at horse shows. So I really try to make sure that my horse isn't touching noses with other horses, just all the things Dr. Abbott mentioned. Um, and those are the things that I really watch for. So where are we now? The, the big thing with where we are now <laughs> is <laughs> um, the FEI, Europe is in, in big trouble. And that's one of the things with these guys is that the European variant that we're dealing with right now is extremely contagious. It is much more contagious than the variant we have going on in any of the United States outbreaks. Uh, and that's where all of those other European countries down for FEI horse shows. And sadly, that means the World Cup got canceled for the second year in a row, which I'm really bummed about. But anyway, uh, so Europe has shut down FEI events and the FEI is recommending that actually all horse shows get shut down. They're trying to do this for that two to three week period that we talked about in terms of quarantining the horses so that we can make sure that things are going quiet. Which brings me back a little bit to WEC in that we haven't had a fever in any of the horses in that barn for, I think we're going on 10 days at this point. Um, yeah, 10 days. So we're feeling pretty good about that barn. 
two horses in the same trainer barn had a fever and both of those tested positive. Another horse had a fever four days later. That horse was in the next aisle over, but tested negative. And we can get into testing if y'all have questions about that. But that makes me feel pretty darn good about them. And especially that trainer was super diligent about taking temperatures. So in the United States, we have a few outbreaks that have facilities quarantined, boarding facilities, and I think a training facility. Um, we frequently have racetracks under some sort of quarantine due to EHV. And it's just something that unfortunately we as a horse industry are trying to have to figure out how we learn to live with this at the moment. The pharmaceutical companies are trying to figure out a better vaccine option that will help us combat this. So everybody is working hard to make this be the best situation it possibly can. But the only way to truly avoid it is never leave your farm. And even then, I will tell you that we see some of the geriatrics that get stressed by cold weather and they will pop with a herpes virus. So it's just something that we live with and we put in the best protocols we can, which if you need help formulating those, any of us can help you with that for your farm. And we try to keep our horses as happy and healthy as we can. So who's got questions? Cause I know you've got questions. How do you disinfect clothing? How do you disinfect clothing? Take it off, put it in the washing machine. Sunshine helps a lot too. Uh, you know, if, if in doubt with something that is gonna be difficult to put into the washing machine, if you put lead ropes, bridles, that sort of thing in the sunshine for three to four hours, there is a lot of things that can't tolerate that, especially if you clean it first. So, you know, clean all of the gunk and goo off. Who hasn't seen bits that are disgusting and foul? Clean all that. It's a great place for herpes to hide along with other stuff and then put it out in the sunshine. If a mare aborted from the herpes virus, how long has she carried this virus? Uh, if a mare aborted from the herpes virus, how long has she carried it? Probably since she was about two years old. Something about pregnancy is stressful. I don't know what that could be, um, carrying a large parasite around. Um, and so again, what we talked about at the beginning, that stress of pregnancy will cause that virus to come out from the nerves and no longer be a latent infection, but now be an active one. And then it will cause the abortion. So she's likely had that virus her whole life. Where we have abortion storms, which is not nearly as common as it was in the 80s before some of these vaccines were developed, where we have abortion storms, where you go onto a large breeding farm and you just have you know, 10, 15 mares abort, that is somebody who has brought in the virus new. When you have one mare do it, it's likely that it was something they've been affected with their whole life. Do we have any Canadian data? There's been some outbreaks, but they're not indicated on that map. Do we have any Canadian data? I know that there are a couple of outbreaks in Canada that are past their quarantine. Um, these were all of the active ones. EDCC, which is the Equine Disease Communication Center, talks about um, herpes virus on, the, they actually talk about all the, the diseases that are common in North America. Um, and they did not have the Canadian ones as active, which means that they have likely gone through their quarantine period. All of those were pretty similar in that we had, you know, some horses affected, but we didn't seem to have the really super contagious, really deadly version, um, the strain really that they have in Europe right now. How long does the virus survive on the surface? How long? It's not a good one for surviving on surfaces. So, you know, pr it depends on how gunky too. So if you have a clean surface, you know, like let's take this screen here. Um, it's clean because it mostly stays rolled up, right? And it's not particularly porous. So if there's not a lot of organic material here, the virus isn't going to last very long. Give it maybe 24 hours on here and it'll be dead. Um, we say it can last a decent amount of time on surfaces, like 21 days, but it actually doesn't do that well. It does maybe, maybe five, six days. Can testing tell if it is an active infection or latent? Uh, so late, can testing tell if it's active or latent? So latent infections, we have no way of knowing if they exist. Um, short of, I am sure that somewhere in some lab somewhere, they can take a dissection of nerves and find it that way but that is not something we can do on living horses readily and not cause serious repercussions. 
So if we test a horse and we find virus shedding, like with the nasal swabs that we use, that is an active infection. And that's why you can feel pretty confident about the horse that was in barn D that had the fever, especially because it was the first fever spike. That horse had a fever and had a nasal swab taken relatively quickly. Those guys are shedding virus at that moment. That is the best time for us to find virus if we're going to find it. So anytime you have a positive horse, that is an active infection. Can this spread to other animals? Can herpes spread to other animals? No, nope. herpes is really fun. It likes to have its own species. So we have a herpes, horses have a herpes, everybody has a herpes, but you only have your own herpes. Is the five in one effective against this? Uh, I'm guessing that if the, is the five in one effective, we're talking about a vaccine. Um, so as we talked about earlier, um, vaccines are a little bit fun with um, EHV. And it's that it reduces nasal shedding, but it doesn't actually present, prevent the disease. Um, is there a choice disinfectant to use? Uh, is there a choice disinfectant to use? Bleach is never wrong, but there are multiple different disinfectants on the market that are less harsh than bleach and will readily kill things. So you can definitely talk to your veterinarian um, or dilute bleach is never a wrong answer. Please stand by. <laughs> What would you recommend for horses that move into a new facility? This is where horse shows get tricky because as Dr. Abbott talked about with quarantining, what we recommend for new horses coming onto a facility is that you have a quarantine barn. That's not always possible. I get that. Um, but what we try for is let's say you don't have a quarantine barn. Maybe you have a quarantine stall where you can do everything else and do that horse last. They can be a stall away from everyone. Um, but generally for most of the horse diseases that we worry about, and this includes strangles, influenza, rhino slash herpes. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but 21 days will get you through making sure that the horse is not actively shedding any of those organisms at that time. Um, if they pop a fever while they're in the quarantine barn, you can certainly do a nasal swab and see if you can figure out if it's, um, usually we're looking for strangles, herpes, and flu. So. Just this easier than, because there's a bunch of comments basically. Can you see me on there, Justin? You guys are okay. Uh, there's a bunch of comments basically on Facebook about um, the outbreaks in Canada and whatnot. Sounds like they're all pretty new within the last couple of days, maybe the last five days or so. So we may not have that information um, yeah, yet. EDCC may not um, have it. They just may not have it updated for us up, you know, in, uh, in the United States. But um, all the same protocol should stay in place. You know, you, you want to quarantine anything that has been tested positive for the virus and treat them, you know, do everything with them last. Biosecurity is going to be your biggest thing. If you have new horses coming into that barn in the future, uh, again, like Dr. Latcher was saying, I would absolutely kind of get yourself either a quarantine stall, quarantine paddock, something like that. So you can keep those new horses coming in. Um, once you're kind of cleared of your quarantine at that point, what I would recommend doing is you just go in and you leach everything, um, get it all really good, clean, disinfected. If you could get the 50 guys from WEC, that'd be great. Oh, but man, they were amazing. I mean, there's kind of a line. I think they're going to go to Latchers <laughs> and mine, but no. Um, but yeah, so, and I don't know, Canada, Canada might be a little bit far for you, but, um, but yeah, just make sure you get everything really, really clean and whatnot. Um, hopefully you can keep, keep the virus from studying that way. sounds like, um, that we've, you've done a pretty decent job at, at quarantining yourself. So that's really good. Um, and I think we just don't really have all the information from Canada yet. Well, and, and no matter what, like you're following the same rules, whether it's any horse show you go to, this, this can be a thing. And that's why, like I said, it's something that we have to live with and, and function with and figure out how we manage as best we can. Why do some horses have the neurological response? Is that particular response lying dormant in that horse or is it a different strain? Why do some horses get the neuro form? We don't know. <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, there's probably genetic variability to how the horse responds. Um, like Dr. York talked about earlier, uh, the virus can cause clots to happen in the brain and around the nerve cells. And that's why some of them get the neuroform. There is a strain associated with the neuroform, 
but even in a population of horses that we know have the same strain, we won't always have the same response from horse to horse. So, all right. Hopefully this clears up a lot of the confusion, but with herpes, trust us, we know. It actually just adds to it. Uh, like I said, with, all, with this particular virus, it's learning to live with it and doing the best you can by your horse. And that means keeping them happy and healthy. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thank you.